that what I just said? More or less? It's a group. American style. I studied French in school, but it's, you know, I was in school a while ago. And then I spent time in Mauritius, so you can learn how to speak French improperly if you go to Mauritius. So, those are good excuses, right? I can't remember, and I got retrained in a country that it's not their main language. Yeah. Radha, Radha, Madhava. <coughs> Krishna Bhutale, Simati Bhakti Veranta Shamini Tinamane, Namaste Sarishati Deve, Kauravani Pracharine. Yavi se sasanyavari paschachad satharine. Si Krishna Chaitana Prabhunitananda Shri Adaita Gadadhar. Shiva Shri Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 
Can you check my Facebook page? No, I did it. Uh, it's on. It's on. Oh, okay. Normally, what I like to do, unless you want me to do something else, is just take questions rather than. I mean, you could give me a topic if you prefer that I speak on a topic, or you could. We could leave it open for questions, and anybody could ask whatever question they want. Yes. Which pastime? <laughs> Krishna's pastimes? Anybody's pastimes? <laughs> oh, that wasn't it. Well, I was saying you could also suggestion for a topic. Yes. What? We'll incorporate that in the answer. Yeah. Okay? Yes. What part of Krishna's pastimes uh, should we. Um, Not here? No, should we offer as proof. Well, this is pretty obvious. As, as proof of his divinity, of course, this. A lot of that. Well, what's interesting is he's saying, well, what, which one of Krishna's pastimes proves his divinity? And of course, you can say the universal form. That was one way he proved it, but... Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, but the joke is, someone went to India you know, like a Westerner went to India in, I don't know when he went, maybe 30 years ago. And he saw how disorganized it was. And he said, the fact that India can do anything is proof that God exists. Because it was so chaotic and disorganized. So that's one proof God exists. India yes. still exists. But what, what I think is most interesting is, is people who don't understand about Krishna, when they hear about Krishna's intimate leelas with his mother and father and friends and girlfriends, their first reaction is, this cannot be God, because there's no morality there. But actually, he's displaying the essence of what, of what God is. So, although there's no necessarily uh, as much grandeur, there's no creation, there's just love and affection. That's the essence of what God is. So, when you hear about Krishna's leelas, especially with his intimate friends, then you get to see what love is. And you start to understand how much love you don't have by seeing how much love they have. And when you hear about Krishna's leelas with Radharani, then you can understand this is what love is and everything else is a perversion. So he's actually showing the highest aspect of God because he's showing the highest aspect of love. And that's the essence of Krishna, is love. So when he shows the highest aspect of love, he's showing the highest aspect of himself. But those who don't understand think, oh, this is immoral or improper because he's not even married to Radharani, and the other gopis are married, and he's calling them away from their husbands. But actually, this is the highest manifestation of God. So, you, know, you could say, Krishna and Vrindavan, Ras Lila, that's how he's demonstrating uh, what God is. And so, one man said uh, to Prabhupada, he said, you know, Krishna's <coughs> stealing all these women. Challenging. Yeah, challenging. And, and he said, he said, you know, he said, he's stealing other men's wives. And he said, you have a wife. And he said, yes. And he, Prabhupada said, you've stolen her from Krishna. All women, all women are Krishna's wives. So that's one answer. But, uh, but an answer, uh, another answer, which is interesting, is that those wives are manifestations of his own shakti. So they're just parts of him. He's dancing with himself. So when Krishna's dancing with the gopis, he's dancing with himself. He's dancing with his own energy. It just it comes out in the female form. 
So when you understand Krishna consciousness, then you understand God creating is not, is not really the ultimate proof. But God, when he reduces himself to a lover, that's the real proof. And you, you can see this in Christianity because in Christianity, many people have not understood the idea that they're not the supreme controller and the supreme enjoyer. But when you hear about Krishna and Radha, then that is a clear demonstration that you cannot do this. You cannot imitate this. And when you lose the desire to imitate it, then you can understand it. And when you understand it, there's no pleasure greater than understanding Krishna's relationship of love with Radha. So I was, uh, one devotee was asking me some questions. And she's saying, you know, it's, it's difficult to control myself sexually. And I said, try to understand, if you want to understand Radha and Krishna and taste it, you won't be able to understand it until you give up your own lust. As long as you have lust, you block yourself from entering deeply into the taste and the understanding of that Leela. So that's what that Leela shows us. It brings us very deep into Krishna consciousness. And if you just think God's the creator, then he becomes the father. What does the father do? The father just gives you things and you just ask for them. And what does Radharani say? If you want to leave me and break my heart, fine with me, as long as it makes you happy. So then we understand. So then we understand what is love. And then Prabhupada says there's no love in the material world. And we, we, that's hard. That's a hard statement because I love my mother. My mother loves me. I love my wife. She loves me. I love Gora. He loves me. Koko Ananda, I think he loves me. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> no, he does. Yeah. So, and I love him. And we all love one another. And so, so what does Prabhupada mean? There's no love. Okay, let's look at Radha and Krishna. Does anyone have the love that Radha has for Krishna, Krishna has for Radha in this world? No. Is there any love in this world that has no motivation at all? Like, the mother's love is pure. But why did the mother want the child in the first place? To, to be loved. To be loved and, and, you know, to want to have the satisfaction of having a child. So there, even though the love is pure, there's still something there. And what's so funny, I remember, Janava, maybe, maybe you felt the same way. Or maybe it's just me as a man. But is it, is it that when kids reach about five and they, go, they start going to school, isn't it a relief? Because now you have till like three o'clock and you're free. And, the, you know, five years of being, is that true or no? Were you, did you feel relief? <laughs> Do other women feel relief? Raise your hand if you have kids and you felt relief when they went to school. I'm sure some do, yeah, the men, more than men. But, okay, for the sake of discussion, let's say some people feel relief. But when Krishna went out to herd the cows, his mother went crazy. She couldn't tolerate that he was leaving. And um, she couldn't let him go. I mean, he was going, but it was very, very difficult for her. That kind of love you don't see, that intensity of love, where, oh, Krishna, you know the story of, of Damodar. So Krishna, Mother Yasoda, went into the kitchen, which was 15 feet away from where she was feeding Krishna. And why did she go in the kitchen? Because it was Krishna's milk was boiling over, so she went in the kitchen to serve him. And, and while she was in the kitchen, stirring the milk and turning down the heat, they were 15 feet away, and they were both feeling intense separation from one another. Could you imagine? How far is 15 feet? Right? You and me, we're 15 feet. And 15 feet, you can see one another, but 15 feet of separation, that doesn't happen. I mean, maybe it happens with a young boy and a girl for like three weeks, but you know, but it's a reflection. 
But, you know, if the, if the child is 15 feet away, the mother doesn't feel intense separation. And Krishna became jealous of Jasoda because she was feeling more separation than he was. Did you know that? So this, like, transcendental jealousy and all these emotions, this is, this is, this is God. So when the Krishna book first came out, it came out in August of 1970. So what was so interesting about this is before August 1970, the average Hare Krishna devotee knew about three pastimes, basically. It was just, you know. It was all we had was the Gita. We didn't have the Krishna book, so we didn't know any pastimes other than if Prabhupada briefly described a pastime in a lecture. You know, Krishna stole butter or Krishna urinated on the floor. Some little Krishna lifted over overtime. We didn't know much. So when we got the Krishna book, all of a sudden, we, we, we learned the pastimes. We're reading things we never heard, every page. It's like, wow, wow, wow. And I was, when it came out, I was 20 years old, and I wrote Prabhupada a letter, and I shared my realization, which was kind of naive and childish, but I was excited, and I said, Srila Prabhupada, nobody knows who God is. Now that the Krishna book is out, they can know. And Prabhupada wrote back, yes, only we know who is God, and we are the ones telling everyone who is God. So he, he shared my excitement. It was just like, you know, it was just like, it was just like a knock over the head. Oh my God, nobody knows what God looks like. Nobody knows what God does. It was just a little young devotee getting hammered in the head because we finally found out because we never had the Krishna book, so we didn't even know. And Prabhupada agreed, so there he is. That's the, the highest manifestation of God is Krishna in Vrindavan with Radha and the gopis. And that's God. And when you understand that, then you understand God. Otherwise, you have the typical leelas, killing demons, lifting Govardhan, creating universal form. But the point is, if someone doesn't want to believe in God, it doesn't matter. Those are just stories. That's mythology. So Bhakti Siddhanta said, for the atheist, he cannot see God anywhere. And for the theist, he sees God everywhere. So the atheist says, how could you believe in God? And the theist says, how could you not believe in God? Yes, right? Because he's seeing God everywhere, and the atheist isn't seeing God anywhere. Right? And the best place for Krishna to hide from the atheist is in the heart, because they'll never find him. Is that okay? Yeah. So one time, Prabhupada asked the devotees, he said, well, how do you know Krishna is God? And they said, he's in Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, Bhagavad Gita is a book, because you said, I could be cheating you. The acharyas say, oh, it's just, um, who knows? He was just blowing it off. And then he said, because you can feel it, because you can feel his presence. When you see him, when you hear about him, when you chant, you can feel his presence. That's how you know he's God. And that's an interesting answer. Isn't it? And then another time, Prabhupada said, how do you know Krishna's God? And everybody was there the last time said, because you can feel. No, because it's in Bhagavad Gita. It's really Prabhupada Gita. And Sri Dikirti was saying, and Prabhupada saying, so how do you know who is your father from your mother? That's how you know. Hare Krishna. Jai. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Hare Krishna. So I think this is a really important point. Because in order to get to the stage of ruchi, actual taste, you have to give up the material taste. And as long as we're trying to taste something material, we block ourselves from getting the spiritual taste. So if you're trying to taste the rasas that Krishna tastes by imitating him, then you can't taste what he's tasting, which is the real pleasure that we're hankering for. So we cheat ourselves by trying to taste, in, by trying to imitate Krishna and taste what he's tasting. We can't taste this extreme nectar, which would completely satisfy us and 
totally detach us from every <coughs> thing in this world. So that's the supreme paradox. The stage of ruchi. You know the stage of ruchi? Ruchi means taste. Everything you do in spiritual life will be tasteful. But you can't get that taste if you don't give up the material taste. So it's a paradox. So here's Krishna and Radha. This is the highest thing in existence. And if your consciousness isn't the lowest thing in existence, you cannot understand the highest thing. So you have to give up imitating Krishna, and then you can begin to understand what is going on, and taste it, experience it. Hmm. What else? Yes. Krishna says, Mad Bhakta Puja one who claims to be my devotee is not my devotee, but one who is the devotee of my devotee is my real devotee. Yes. So you travel the world, you deal with thousands of devotees. Uh, according to your insight, uh, what do you think is uh, preventing devotees? What are some of the things that are preventing devotees? from having better relationships with one another, since we can't go to Krishna huh. without loving each other. Well, one interesting realization I had, which would answer this question, but answer some, many questions about what's preventing any of us from achieving anything. Could you repeat the question? The other question is, what's preventing us from having better relationships? Because. You know, Krishna says, you're not my devotee unless you're a devotee of my devotee. Then I accept you as a devotee. So that being the case, we would want to have good relationships with the devotees, but we don't always have good relationships. Let me tell the story. It's quite funny. <clears throat> There's a seminar <clears throat> given by a company in Canada. I don't think they exist anymore, <clears throat> but it was called The Millionaire Mind. You went to that, right? So, the basis of this seminar is that if you want to become wealthy, you have to have a wealthy mindset. And if your mindset is poor, even if you try to become wealthy, you just go to poor. Like people who win the lottery, if they have a poor mindset, in six years, the statistics are six years, they go bankrupt. Or athletes who are making phenomenal amounts of money, then you read in the paper, so-and-so is bankrupt. And he, he makes like $50,000 a week or something. And he's like, how could he go bankrupt? It's, it's a mindset. So he talks a lot, a lot about having the mindset of money. And there's a lot of people who feel that that's really superficial. You know, you're just thinking about money, you know, and money's important, and money, money, money. And he divides the audience up into people who have different money blueprints, and the people who think money's not important go into one, you remember that? They go into one group. Different pots or jars? Yeah, different, um, well, they're different groups. How many, how many are spenders? How many are savers? How many think money's not important? So he said, sometimes people come up to him and say, you know, what you're teaching is okay, but money's not that important. And then he asks them a question. Oh, he, he says, you're broke, aren't you? And, and they all go, yeah. <laughs> well, if money's not important, you're broke. It, well, health's not important. You're not healthy, are you? Uh, not really. Relationships aren't important. You don't have good relationships, do you? No, not really. So that's one aspect of the problem. I, I you know, I counsel devotees, marriage counsel, and, and, and one of the problems I see in marriages is it's like if you can get to zero, which means, you know, only pots and pans flying every other Thursday, then you think, oh, this is pretty good, you know, we made it to, you know, we, it used to be knives flying every day, now it's, it's only pots every other Thursday. So they're like, oh, okay, that's fine. It's like they don't care. They just want to get to zero. Okay, zero, you know, it's not so bad, you know. How's your car running? Well, you know, the tires are horrible. This is horrible, but it's, it gets me to work. You know, it's just like, I don't want to put money into it. So if you don't want to invest in a relationship, people don't care, how can you have a good relationship? You, you have to value it, right? So I want to tell a story. It's a beautiful, 
Très joli. How do you say story? Histoire. Histoire. Très joli. Histoire. Yeah. And it takes place with one devotee from Montreal. I don't know if he's here anymore. His name is Mahat Seva. Does anyone know Mahat Seva? He went to uh, San Diego? Or? No, it's uh, Saranagan. Oh, yeah. So he used to be in San Diego. It, no, he used to be in L.A. when I was there. So Mahat Seva and one other devotee named Balaram went from L.A., I think, to Mount Rushmore, which is like South Dakota, North Dakota, something like thousands of miles, 2,000 miles or 1,800 miles from Los Angeles. But there was a problem. Both of them wanted to be in charge. So you can imagine, there's two people traveling and living together, and they both want to be in charge. And Mahatseva was older, so he was in charge. So Balaram was driving Mahatseva nutty because he wouldn't listen to anything he said because I don't want to listen to you, you know. So it was really bad. And so this is before the days of cell phones. So in those days, you get dropped off at a place where you will distribute books and then your partner goes somewhere else and says, I will pick you up right here at this corner at 9 o'clock. Yeah, there's no way to know where he is or get in touch with him. And often you're at a shopping center and then security comes and says, you can't stay here. So you have to find somewhere else to go, walk, take a taxi, hitchhike, and then come back to that spot at 9 o'clock. You, you can't, how do you call him? He doesn't have a phone. So you just go back. So Mahatseva dropped, Bal, dropped Balaram off, said, I'll pick you up at 9 o'clock. He went and did his book distribution in different places. And he came back at 9 o'clock, and lo and behold, there was no Balaram. Which you might think, wow, what a relief. No Balaram. We've been fighting for three weeks, you know, huh? I'd rather be alone. No, he didn't think that way. So he drives around because sometimes you just figure, well, if, if he was asked to leave here, he's probably at the shopping center across the street or maybe he's over here at the McDonald's. It's, you know, whatever. You, you look around. So he looked around at all the logical places and he couldn't find him. 9.30, 10, 10.30, 11. And so Balaram, I don't know where he was, but he's also thinking, how am I going to meet up with Mahatseva because there's no phone and I was late. So, you know, he probably got there like 9.45, but now Mahatseva's looking for him. And then when Mahatseva comes back at 10.30, he's not there because he's looking for him. So they, and both of them had the same realization. They both were thinking, they were young devotees. There are no devotees in this city. They are about 2,000 miles from their home temple. And they both were thinking, I don't want to be alone in this city because I don't trust myself. Maybe I'll go to the bar. Maybe I'll find drugs. Maybe I'll meet a girl. Maybe I'll even see a prostitute. They were both really worried about spending the night alone because they were very young devotees in the middle of nowhere, so to speak, and in terms of Krishna consciousness. So about 11 o'clock, they finally met up together. Do you think they were happy to see one another? They were very happy. <laughs> Isn't that a nice story? So I think, I think sometimes maybe we undervalue the association. So I may not like you, and you may not like me, but the fact is, by being together, we're safe in Krishna consciousness. Isn't it? So it's not like you have to like everyone to have a good relationship, but at least appreciate the association of devotees is valuable. And then you have close friends, and you have friends that are just more like acquaintances. But, but you, you, we want to learn to respect all devotees, and it's, it's difficult to respect devotees when you disagree with them, isn't it? Like, some devotees have certain beliefs which I find how, what's the word? Well, I'll just say unbelievable. I can't believe that they actually think that way. Like, I, you know, it, it's like, how could you think like this? This is like, doesn't relate to anybody or anything that's going on in the world today. And, and if you say this, people will shoot you. 
They go, no, no, this is the way it's supposed to be. And, and you know, sometimes I write them on, you know, and say, how can you say this? This is ridiculous. And, and so there was one devotee like that. He was like, he was like the incarnation of Manu Samhita. And he was a Manu Samhita thumper, you know. It was like, you know, women this, and cut your hands off if you steal. You know, it was like the whole nine yards, right? And I used to write him because I would be so upset that he would be, I said, how can you think like this? This is not the way Prabhupada preached. He's like, no, 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 we have to establish Varnashram and, you know, women this and Brahmins this. And I was like, oh my God, if I never see you the rest of my life, I'll be very happy. You know, that's how I felt, right? So one fine day, I was in Mauritius, and every year in Mauritius they have a boat festival, and what they do is they rent boats, and they have kirtan in all the boats. So they have lots of devotees there. So they have kirtans in all the boats, and one boat has the deities, and so you go around and have your kirtans, right? So I'm on the boat, and, and this one place, very nice, we got, you know, the VIP boat, right? So I'm sitting on the boat, and someone sits next to me, and I look over, who do you think it was? <laughs> it was him. Oh my God. So, you want to hear the rest of the story? <laughs> the reality was, we didn't talk about anything other than, wow, well, it was a beautiful day, nice kirtan. And then we ended up talking about Ritvikism. And we both don't like Ritvik, so we were agreeing. So we were bonding over, you know, you find things you, you, don't, uh, you both don't like and you bond, you know. And then later on, we went back and we needed to book some tickets or confirm. And he said, well, let me do it, I'll do it. And, he, and then he was showing us pictures of his family. And it's like we were bonding on this level of personal, one-on-one -on -one friends. So it was, it was an important experience for me because on the internet, I actually, you ever have that feeling? You read someone and something, he goes, a good thing I don't see you because if I did, I would strangle you right now. You know that feeling? How can you say this? You know, if I just strangle you, you can't speak. So it solves the problem. Of course, not that we feel exactly that way, but you, you understand what I mean. Something that is so upsetting, you wish you could just like get some duct tape and like and tape his fingers so he can't type, you know, just you want to shut him down. So that's how I felt towards him. But when we were together, just as individual people, it was completely different. So I think that's an important realization because sometimes we just don't like a devotee because they have a certain point of view, but they're actually a very nice person and a very nice devotee, isn't it? Yeah. So I think that, that from our perspective, that's something we have to look at. And, and I've always felt that every devotee has something to teach me even if I don't agree with everything they say, or maybe I don't like the way they sing, or the way they give class, or the way they distribute books, or the way they do arctic, or whatever, or the way they manage. But still, there's so much good about them. And if I only focus on the bad, I don't get the benefit of the good. And if I look past the bad to see the good, then I benefit. Oh, he's very good. He does this really well, and I don't. And I get inspired. So I think, I think that's the beginning, realizing the importance of relationships. Otherwise, it's, so e it's really easy to have bad relationships. Have you noticed that? You don't have to work on it very much. They kind of just happen, you know, without even trying. Because there's so many things we dislike about people, isn't it? And so I think it's a, it's, it's a challenge we all have to appreciate someone who we don't appreciate, if you know what I mean. You know what I mean? Appreciate someone you don't appreciate. Find what you can appreciate. And another thought I have, and sometimes, you know, we have little quarrels with devotees or devotees get upset with us or we get upset with them. But I know if I was in trouble, if I was in difficulty, that devotee, no matter how much we didn't get along, that devotee would come and help me. If I was on my deathbed, he, w he would do everything he could to help me remember Krishna. I'm convinced, even the ones that have, may have said horrible things about me or vice versa, if I'm there on my deathbed and they're close and I needed their help, they would do it. Isn't it? You agree? Oh, you don't know. You're not sure. Anyway, let's think, let's make believe that would happen. Okay.
okay? Because I think in most cases it would happen. And devotees have soft hearts. And then the other thing is sometimes we find devotees who are upset about something and you know, if we're empathetic to their concerns and their past experience, that also helps the relationship. You know? How can you say that? That's offensive. That's, you know, that doesn't make for good relationships. Right? <laughs> you know, we have, we have a challenge because it's very easy for us to be judgmental because we have so many things, so many standards we can judge one another by. Right? So if you're not a devotee, your, your friend comes home and says, yeah, I got drunk last night. I had you know, like 20 bottles of vodka. And you're like, cool, and you're still standing. You're a real man, you know. You, you think that's great. And I, you know, I had, I had three girlfriends last night. You go, oh my God, I'm envious of you. So, in the material world, people do horrible things, but we may have such low standards that we think the horrible things are good. So the tendency, the, the standard of judgment is like way down for many of us, isn't it? I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course, but... The standards are lower. But for devotees, you got all sorts of things. Yeah. You, know, you came to Mangalarti at 431. What's wrong with you, Prabhu? You're not serious, you know. I mean, it says right there in the ashram, if you live here, it's 430 and you're 431. You know, we can become like that. I have to admit, I've been like that. You know? Some senior devotee comes, it's 431. It's like, what's up with him? <laughs> you know, he probably just got up at 4.29, didn't take a shower, and just slapped on some tilak and ran in. You know, what kind of example is this? You know, he's a sannyasi and he's coming at 4.31. So, you know, it makes no sense, does it? Right? But we have these standards, so we have so many ways we can judge people. And you have probably noticed that in religious organizations, they tend to be judgmental. Have you noticed? Because there's more to judge. But that doesn't make for good relationships, judging people, being more accepting, loving and affectionate. So it goes back to my original point. You have to want to have good relationships. You want good relationships or you just want to judge people? What, what do you want? What's your goal in life? No, I'd rather judge them. You know, because it's 431 and they're and they're sannyasi. This is bad. I'm reporting this to GBC. Okay, you want to live like that? That's the life you want? I'm not talking to Maharaj. Why not? Because he came at 431. And that's bad. <laughs> and you know, okay, we're exaggerating, but not much. Not much. So I think that's an important realization. I mean, are these relationships important to you? Or is judging more important? Is being right more important? No, 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 he did this, I can't talk to him, I can't even look at him. Then we become so, so much about justice and right and wrong, we can't have relationships. Right? So what, do you want a relationship or not? What do you want? you rather judge? Now, some of us, by nature, like to judge. That's just how we are. We judge. We're made up of that. And... Um, if that's what you are, it, it's something you have to confront because it, it can border, it can lead you into making offenses if you're too judgmental. As Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, there's so many ways you can offend a devotee and judging a devotee is a big one. Now, another thing we've seen, which is quite common, is when you judge somebody, often, it comes back to you. Like, I used to be very sarcastic um, uh, with my wife. I'm not so sarcastic anymore, am I? No, I've become much better. Are you trying to be sarcastic? What? Are you trying to be sarcastic? <laughs> so, um, I was so sarcastic that once my wife couldn't find her keys, and I said, oh, it must be the annual key losing ceremony. You know, to say, like, you always lose your keys, you know? So I'm, but instead of saying you always lose your keys, I'm clever. Oh, it's the annual key losing ceremony. Guess what happened to my keys the next day? I couldn't find them, yeah. I had my annual key losing ceremony. And I'm sure you've all experienced that, that sometimes judge not lest you be judged. The thing you're judging, it comes back to you. Um, that's the way the world works, right? Karma 
I criticize you for something, then I end up doing it myself. So I have to be careful. So what do you want? You want a relationship or you just want to evaluate people and, and distance yourself? Yes? What happens when you judge someone for being judgmental? <laughs> you judge someone because they're judgmental. Yeah, two wrongs don't make a right. What, what, uh, what need does someone have? The need. They're what, what need does... Well... What are you trying to fulfill? I think, I can speak for myself. He's asked, Gore is asking, well, if we're judging, what need do we have? Well, one need I think we have is we want those who are senior or respectable devotees to set an example. And I've noticed in myself, and I've seen it in other people, when you're weak in an area, you want other people to be strong in that area because you need that, because you're weak. And if you're depending, like if Gore is depending on me to get up early in the morning because he has a hard time and then I don't get up, that's going to disappoint him because he feels like, I can't do it myself, I need you. So a lot of times we expect our leaders and seniors to be examples. And so this judgment is coming from this point of, I need this as an example, either for myself or I feel the other devotees need it. So that could be one reason. Who could give another reason? Why would we judge? Yes? Why is he getting away with it? I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's getting away with it, no one's saying anything. And when I do it, everybody says, yeah. Because we have low self-esteem and by criticizing another, it's, yeah. it's related to envy. Uh, low self-esteem makes you feel better if you bring others down. So, you know, um, there can be, like I'm saying, there can be real reasons that we're judgmental, but it's, a, it's how you process it, right? So let's say, you know, so Gora comes to me and says, you know, I'm really weak now, and I really, I really want to get up early, and I'm really depending on you. So then now I know what he's expecting. The, the interesting thing about expectation and judgment, we all have expectations, and we're, we're often let down, but after we're let down, I always ask the question, did you ever tell that person what you were expecting from them? And generally the answer is no. So, okay, you're expecting me to come to Mangalarti, but what if I stay up till one o'clock at night at some preaching program? Just physically, it's not gonna be good for me to do that. I'm not strong enough to do that. I travel a lot, and from experience, when I do that, I get sick. So you say, you know, Mahatma Prabhu, we didn't see you Mangal Arti, and we're expecting you to do that. And I say, oh, oh, I didn't know that. Maybe I shouldn't go on late night programs. And I say, is this a big expectation in the temple? And they say, yes, we really expect our leaders to come. Because maybe for so many years our leaders didn't come, and it's really... So now I know, then I can adjust my schedule. So you, you can talk about it. So that way, instead of faulting me, it's discussed and it's explained. So the, the difficulty is, if I have an issue with someone, it's an opportunity either to create communication and come closer, or to be more distant and offensive and judgmental. So it's not, the fact that I'm not coming to Mangalarti is not the problem. The problem is how you, who are upset by it, deal with it, right? Just an announcement tomorrow. I'm not coming to Mangalarti because I'm not going to be here. We're not coming to Mangalarti? No. no, no, we're not. I'll be far away, too far. Yeah, I'm staying at Lakshmi now. So, a lot of situations, it, it's not about the problem, it's about how you deal with the problem, how you process it, the consequence of it. Um, Judgment in itself is not bad, but we can make it bad. You know, someone will say, well, am I not supposed to see that some senior devotee is not following the things that we all have to follow? No, you do see it. But now once you see it, how do you process it? How do you deal with that in a way that's helpful for you and helpful for them? Otherwise, you process it in a negative way. Then you make offenses, right? Yes, you have that experience? I was when Lakshmi Moni invited me to the Vaishnava Sangha, she said, What do you want to teach? And I was 
I was in a certain space or state of mind, so I was joking. And I said, I want to teach how to survive in ISKCON. And she took it seriously. She said, yeah, that would be a good course. It probably would be. So this might be a lesson, how to survive. But it's how to survive in any community. When you see something that falls short, it's always good to ask, Maharaj, Prabhu, I was expecting you would do this. Why did you not? Or why did you do this? And let them explain. And, and it's really good to know for seniors what you expect of them. Because they may think doing X, Y, and Z, or you say Z in Canada? X, Y, Z? So British. X, Y, and Z. <laughs> X, Y, and Z, I think it's better. But you tell me A, B, and C is better. Oh, I didn't know that. Why do you think it's better? Oh, now I understand. Okay, I'll do that. So it's actually just quite simple, isn't it? Yeah. I'm going to explain that. Will he react? Will it make it worse? Yeah. Of course, that's another issue. is saying, the other issue is, well, what if I explain it and then the person explodes on me? Yeah. That is an issue, no <laughs> doubt. And if that is the issue and you know they're going to explode, you probably just better just not say anything. Or uh, talk to someone who could talk to them. <clears throat> now, sometimes we say, well, you know, if you have a problem with the temple president, go to the GBC. If you have a problem with the GBC, go to the EC. If you have a problem with the EC, go to the GBC. If you have a problem with the GBC, I don't know where you go. Go to hell or something. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, that's the way it's set up. But uh, let's say Lakshminath the president, and I have a problem with him, and I go to the GBC, and I say Lakshminath is doing this wrong. And then the GBC comes back to Lakshminath, and Lakshminath is like, well, we're friends, why didn't you just tell me? So then it makes it worse. So you have to be careful. Or you know that so-and-so <coughs> is not going to appreciate your feedback. Or <coughs> we learn how to communicate better. You know, explain it in a way that maybe, maybe he'll be able to understand. You know, Maharaj, you are the, like the best thing that ever hit Iskand. This, just would it be possible that you could do this because I think it would help the devotees? And I know, you, you know, I know you have other important things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you do this, I think if you consider it, you know, sometimes you have to deal with people that way because they're sensitive, right? Yes. What if the GBC goes to the president and says, "Listen, this guy's acting. You better be careful. What time is right?" Then what do you do? I don't know. Start your own temple or something. <laughs> Go join another movement. I don't know. Um, you don't have to blow things out of all proportion. Yeah, I, I think um, the main thought that keeps coming to me is we have to learn how to communicate better. You know, and there's a lot of bad ways to communicate and a lot of good ways. And one of the good ways is you're telling somebody what you need so you're not faulting them. You know, we really need you to come to Mangalarti because we're just a, a bunch of young devotees and it's so inspiring when you come. So you didn't say, Maharaj, what's up? You're not coming to Mangalarti. What's wrong with you? You know, you're setting a bad example. You're saying, we need you to come. So there's no, there's no criticism, no demeaning. Just like, it would be so inspiring if you come. So, oh, okay. So it's easier to, for him to understand. So, so sometimes... What you say is true. No matter how you say it, it doesn't work. But sometimes it's just the way we said it. Or the mood, or the motive. You know, or maybe you don't like that Maharaj, and he knows you don't like him. So as soon as you open your mouth, it's like... Right? So maybe sometimes it's establishing a relationship that's important. And when the relationship is good, then now communication can take place. I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. Yeah, I don't care what you know until I know that you care. You know, we're all fragile individuals. I was mentioning today in class that this morning I was thinking of a few devotees I know who are fantastic leaders and very, very friendly and very affectionate and very close with all the people that agreed with everything they said and did. And if you didn't agree with everything they said and did, your life was quite miserable. 
So understanding that, okay, that's just the nature of that person. They need allegiance and obedience. And if you can't give it, then it's probably going to be difficult to work with them. And so knowing that, you know how to adjust. Or maybe you want to stay in the zone, but you're, you're not going to have, be able to work well in every situation, but you just don't ruffle any feathers. Because if you do, your life gets miserable and you just have to tolerate it. And see, you know, is Krishna going to let them stay in that position? And in many cases, he doesn't. He doesn't like it. So, um, I've been through that situation many times, you know, love it or leave it kind of thing. And so, you know, okay, pros and cons, I'd rather, I'll love it because I like it even though I don't like everything. And what can you do? There's another thing that I personally did is when, when I saw things which I didn't think were healthy, then I made a mental note of it. And then when I manage, I make a note not to do that. And so it's said that bad managers are good teachers because they teach you what not to do. And one time we had a problem uh, with one of the leaders in our movement. He did something which uh, it wasn't healthy for his disciples. And I made a mental note of how much they were suffering. And, and I made a note that as a leader I will not do this because I saw the result. So sometimes you can learn from the mistakes of others. And if you're sarcastic like me, you can say, thank you, Mar from Maharaj, for teaching me how to manage. You did an excellent job. <laughs> he said, what did I teach? You taught me not to do everything you do. You know, of course, you wouldn't say that. <clears throat> and it wouldn't exactly be that way. But there would be some things he did that had a bad effect on the devotees. And you made a note not to do that. And there's nothing you can do. You don't want to talk to him about it because he doesn't want to hear about it. But in that sense, he helped you. That, that's happened to me many times. You know, I can tell you what not to do because I've seen people do it and it didn't work. I'm, I can, I'm like an encyclopedia of what not to do. Right? I guess it helps you to appreciate the person rather than hate him. Why don't you be helping out? Like yeah, exactly. Know. Yeah. So I'm grateful to the guy. Yeah, exactly. That's. Yeah, I wouldn't tell him he helped me. I wouldn't tell him why he helped me out, but it's true. And someone had to make those mistakes. And in some sense, you can realize, well, he was only like 26 when he made those mistakes. And pretty much anyone at that age is going to make some pretty big mistakes. So he made it. That means I didn't have to make it. So thank you. I'm glad you made it instead of me. So I appreciate that. You know, many of our leaders who had difficulty because they were young men, I think probably I would have had the same difficulty. But because you had it, I could observe it. And then I didn't make that mistake. So that was a service you did. So there's always a way to look at things, right? You can always twist it in a way. This, this, is, this is my thinking. And I think this is very important. A lot of times we're trying to achieve something, but if we actually consider our attitude and our thinking, it doesn't allow us to achieve it. We're not lined up to achieve it. So I always think, okay, I want to achieve this, so if I'm critical or judgmental or etc., that's blocking my ability to achieve this. Even though those people, what I'm saying, what they did, they did it. I'm not making it up. But, but I'm trying to be more positive, more encouraging, more inspiring, and I'm trying to inspire myself. So I don't want to see things that way. So I think that's important. You ask yourself, okay, if I see it this way, is that helping me? And you all know if you focus on the negative long enough, you become discouraged. Right? And if you don't believe me, do it. And I guarantee within seven days, you'll be completely discouraged if you just focus on negative. Whatever you're against, will drain your energy and whatever you're for will give you energy. So if you want to achieve something, then you want to be lined up with your attitude, your consciousness, so you can achieve it. Right? So even though I could criticize you, I don't want to because I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be that kind of person. And I don't want to set that example. So I don't. Even though I have the right to, 
I still don't do it because it won't serve my ultimate purpose. So I think that's very important. And I think a lot of us are not lined up with what we want to achieve and then we wonder why we're not achieving it. Well, look at how you're thinking. Look at what you're believing. Look at how you're acting. And that will explain why you're not getting there. Yes? What about constructive criticism? I've seen someone doing something that might be in their blind spot. Wouldn't it yeah. help them if we told them about it? He's asking, if you see somebody making a mistake and they don't see it or they don't know it, would it be helpful for them if you tell them? Definitely yes, definitely no. Depends on who them is and who you are, what the relationship, and do you have a contract with them that they want you to tell them? Like Daniel, you can tell Daniel because Daniel wants to know when he's making a mistake. He, is, he has told me that he likes that. So is that okay, Daniel, if you make a mistake? He's happy if you tell him. Um, now, I want to ask that same question to everyone here. Raise your hand <coughs> if when you make a mistake, what's your name? B-A-D-E-R. Badder? Badder. Raise your hand if you want Badder to tell you what mistake you're making if you make it. Okay, so look around. These are the people you can tell, and everyone else don't tell. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> And he, he's asking all of you to correct him. <laughs> so that's good. Out of love. Out of love. Out of love, yeah. So we only would correct someone because we care about them and we want to help them. That's why. Yes? Does that make sense? Five minutes? Yes, five minutes. We have another? Couldn't get along with people who didn't agree with them. So why do you think that this happened? Oh, why? It's their nature. I, I might have also been... Some, some people have that nature that if people don't agree with them, they can't deal with them. So it's obviously an obstacle to relationships and management, but it may be deeply ingrained in their nature. So and or they may have been in charge for so long that they haven't really dealt with people who don't agree with them. They've only been dealing with people who are assigned to agree with them. And so, understandably, they're not used to people not agreeing, and they may take it in the wrong way, like, you don't like me, or you're cutting me down, but they're just making suggestions. It's nothing. So that could be a reason. Um, I was temple president eight months after I became a devotee. And then after I was temple president, shortly after I was in charge of something, and then shortly after in charge of something. So pretty much my whole devotional life, I was in charge of something until I got married. And I, wasn't, I was no longer in charge of everything. But that's the, a side point. But <laughs> so you can imagine for someone like me who's always in charge and used to people doing what I say, how hard it is to deal with people who say, I'm not going to do that. That's not right. I don't agree with that. It's not that I can't, but it's more difficult because I've become so accustomed. So for better or for worse, there are many devotees in our movement who've been in leadership positions, kind of autocratic leadership positions, just due to circumstance. And so they're just used to that. And it throws them off sometimes. They're just, Or they think, Unless there's complete unity, you can't accomplish anything. So anyone who's not united with me, I just I have to get rid of them. There could be so many ways, and it could just be their nature that they can't get along with people who don't agree. And they will fight, fight, fight to get you to agree. So if you are like that, at least be aware of it. And don't and be open to listen to people, listen to other perspectives. And so when Whenever I talk about a problem that I see in another devotee, I'm only saying that so you could see if you have that problem. Not that we all think, oh yeah, I know a devotee like that. You know, so often when I talk about a problem, I'm thinking, you're supposed to be thinking, do I have that problem? But you're all thinking, oh, I know someone with that problem. 
It really defeats my whole purpose. I'm not talking about someone else. I'm talking, do you have this problem? And do you notice that you're like this? And if so, do something about it. And if you notice someone else is like that, then at least be aware and deal with them in a way that you can get along better, knowing that they need a certain level of respect. Is that okay? So, we can end now? We have to be back in half an hour. Have to be back in half an hour. So, many of you know that I have some books here and CDs and USB sticks with classes. So, um, they're beautiful books. We have a few left. And um, this is all about things that we've talked about today and talked about in the workshop. How to practically apply Krishna consciousness. How to become humble. How to become humble so you can chant humbly. We have a chapter on humility, forgiveness, how to overcome fault finding, controlling yourself, emotional management, managing beliefs, so many wonderful things. And those are also on the USB sticks and my music. And we have another book. Um, if you have friends who aren't devotees, this is a great book for them. I think they'll really appreciate it and understand more about spiritual life. And it's also good for you. So I'll just be waiting here if you're interested and I can sign them. And then... Are you still giving class tomorrow morning? Mm, I, don't think, I don't think so. I don't think so, because I'll be staying at Lakshmi Nasas, unless you want me to give it on Skype. Okay. And uh, how early are you leaving Tuesday? I think the flight's at 10. Tuesday morning? Yeah. Talk to Lakshmi and see. Oh, yeah. It's possible. I don't know. We have, we have flights at 10, so we have to be at the airport at 8. Yeah. 8? 30. International okay. flight. So this is the last class. Okay, thanks. Separate. My wife says no. <laughs> wife says no, I can't. You know, that's... Okay, problem solved. Okay. So we're feeling separation. Last time we saw you was 12 years ago, so maybe we can come more often than every 12 years. And um, I have cards here that give you the address for my Facebook, YouTube, etc., etc., website. Um, but my website is easy to remember, mahatmadas.com. We have many, many articles, many, many audio and video files. And I also have a daily video. We have newsletters, daily messages. You can sign up all on my website. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Go Pramananda.